Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Meaning of Catholic. This is the Paleocrat Diaries, and I'm your host, Jake Fowler, for the Ecumenical Councils Part 8. So, not in a real great mood right now, because I had just recorded this episode with my microphone off. Hmm. Oh well, I've still got half a cup of coffee, I've still got my outline, and I'm going to live by the paleocrat motto, to never give up. I'm going to keep on smiling, even though I really don't want to. And, of course, I will one day die. Not today. Probably not. We'll see. Nonetheless, welcome back. Here we are again. We're discussing, we had been discussing, the Council of Chalcedon. I believe we left off looking at Canon 28, looking at the status of the council itself. It had concluded sometime in November 451. Big party. Everybody was really pumped, except the papal legates. Oh well. Let me turn this down as I normally do. Sip my coffee as I normally do. Mm. Trying not to be bitter about forgetting to turn the mic on. Totally pulled a Jeremiah on that one. Okay, here we go. So, what was I saying? We have just finished the Council of Chalcedon in 451. The legates and the other bishops, they were kind of bickering about Canon 28. If you recall, Canon 28 is the one that gives equal status and privileges to Constantinople because it's New Rome. After all, it's the seat of the empire. It's an important place to be. The legates protested this after the fact. Remember, they were gone the day that the the canon was being discussed. So despite ending on a bit of a sour note, there was still a lot of joy. They had hammered out Um, the statement of faith that the imperial officials had asked for, what we refer to now as the definition of Chalcedon. And, for all intents and purposes, they had crushed the Monophysite heresy. Leo, uh, the pope, receives word from his legates, from the council, the bishops, and from Marcion, the Roman emperor, and they all write to him, and they're, they, they have their own perspectives, of course, and they're just so excited to present to the Holy Father the work of the council. And Leo waited six months to reply. The reception was a, a bit of a cool one, you might say. He was pleased with the definition but he was very outraged at what he viewed as a usurpation by the Patriarch of Constantinople, a man named Anatolius. Leo sent letters to the Emperor, Marcion, and his wife, Pulcheria, to address this issue. He's not really thrilled with the perceived power grab. Leo says this goes against Nicaea, and this is contrary to custom. Why are we doing this, Leo says. The East pleaded their case with him. They said, well, contrary to custom, says who? Our custom is to behave exactly in the manner that we've described. So this was a long-standing thing in the East, at least six decades, probably more than that, where there were special privileges accorded to the Patriarch of Constantinople. Fair enough, Leo was not persuaded by this. More time goes by. And Marcion writes again to the Pope, asking him to please, please, please confirm the council because the Monophysite heretics are using Leo's delay to their advantage. This was in February of 453. Marcion suggests to Leo that he can confirm the definition and the decrees of Chalcedon, but not the canons. Leo's intrigued by this idea. Confirm the decree, not the canons. It's a win-win in his mind. So that's what he does in March of 453, about 14, 15 months after, no, excuse me, longer than that, uh, almost a year and a half, after the council had concluded, 
Leo finally confirms it. So it's ratified. It's ecumenical. It's been received by the church in the East, by the church in the West. It has received papal approbation. Except the canons, there's a lesson here that I think we can learn something from. And that is that the, the Holy Father can confirm or not confirm the decrees of a council in the manner he chooses. Although it was Marcion's idea, Leo was the one who performed the action. In this case, he confirmed the definition and did not confirm the canons. Conciliar acts, if they're judged inappropriate, inadequate, uh, unsatisfactory for whatever reason, the Holy Father can simply refuse to confirm them. Or if he does confirm them, but give a different interpretation. We'll see that coming up uh, two councils from now. Nonetheless, Leo has confirmed Chalcedon. However, the matter between he and Anatolius is unresolved. In order for this Anatolius to be reconciled back to the See of Rome, the Apostolic See, Leo demands that he renounce the so-called privilege bestowed upon him by Canon 28. Anatolius is all too happy to do this. He wrote back to Leo, humbly submitting himself and even distancing himself from the canon. He says, look, that wasn't my idea. Okay, yes, maybe I kind of liked it. However, I claim no direct responsibility for that. I sort of just let it happen. But, Holy Father, I'm very happy to meet all of your demands. Leo's other demands were keep the Catholic faith, obey the laws of Nicaea. The reunion then between Leo and Anatolius of Constantinople was completed in May of 454. Now, it should be noted before we move on that the canon in question, Canon 28, uh, the bishop of Constantinople never stopped doing the things that were associated with this so-called privilege. He continued on hearing appeals from various churches in the East. He continued on with the confirmation of bishops from other metropolitan sees. So it seems that even though it wasn't law uh, on the books de jure, it was on the books de facto in practice. So not by law, but in practice. So that sort of raises some questions. Uh, does this amount to disobedience to the Holy See? Not really. Leo didn't say, stop doing the things you've been doing. He never said, hey, all these customs that you have in the East, those have to go. He's attacking this special privilege that elevates Constantinople up onto equal footing with the See of Rome on the basis that, well, this is now the seat of the empire. This is where the imperial capital is. So obviously it's important. We need to be equal to Rome. Leo has the understanding that it's Peter, Peter and Paul, who are the reason why Rome has primacy. So, could we say then that we're simply following the will of a council and maybe the Holy Father's mistaken? Perhaps. Is this an error in prudential judgment? We'll see. And to that point, if only the canon were condemned, but again, not the practices associated with it, is it okay if we keep going with the practices? Obviously, they thought yes in the East. Uh, final note, the canons, the canon was eventually accepted into the Eastern collections and about 800 or so years later into the Western collections as well. That was at the Second Council of Lyon in 1274. But I digress, I'm jumping ahead too far. Let's go back to the East and take a peek at some of the reactions. Right after the council concluded... A certain monk named Theodosius, who was from Palestine, from the Holy Land, he raced back home and he gave a very, very unfavorable report. So much so 
that when Juvenal of Jerusalem, the bishop of Jerusalem, that city, he couldn't even enter the city because Theodosius the monk had stirred people up so much that Chalcedon was in error. Hmm. Recall, it was Juvenal who was one of the leading protagonists at the robber council of Ephesus, where Dioscorus kind of latches on to this strongly Cyrillian interpretation of Christology. This is the one where Flavian lost his life. And then a few years later, this same Juvenal of Jerusalem, he switched sides He was with Dioscorus when Chalcedon opened, but hearing the other side of things, he changed his mind, and rightly so, good for him. But it didn't win him any friends back home. They thought he was like one way, and now he's the opposite. Fanatical monks prevented him from entering his own city. So the emperor had to send military intervention to Jerusalem. In Alexandria, it was a similar sort of thing. Dioscorus being deposed, they need a new bishop, a new patriarch. And they found a man, an archpriest of the diocese by the name of Proterius. He was appointed, but the people refused to accept him. They thought Dioscorus had been done wrong. They thought it was injustice. How could they just depose him like that? He's upholding the apostolic faith. Riots ensued, and there was blood. Emperor Marcion died a few years later in 457, and Leo I assumes the throne. Not Leo I, Bishop of Rome, Leo I, Roman Emperor. So we have two Leo Firsts. I'll try to keep them straight. With the change in government, the Monophysites took the opportunity to overthrow Proterius, and they wanted to prop up in his place a leading Monophysite, a man named Timothy. Now, Timothy is an interesting character. He's got an odd nickname. In Greek, it's Aelurus, or the cat. Timothy the cat. Why do they call him that? Well, According to the sources that I had read, he was tall, he was very thin, and sort of moved in a sleek way, sort of like a cat. And apparently he was also very dainty. So the nickname seems to be pretty fitting. Timothy the Cat was not exactly a Eutychian. He didn't follow the monk Eutyches in his muddle-headed theology. But he was a very staunch Cyrillian. You could say he's more Cyrillian than Cyril. He thought Chalcedon was a Nestorian council. In other words, he believes Chalcedon is a heretical council. Timothy the cat was not allowed into the city. He was driven away by the military. But a few weeks later, a mob of people surprised Proterius, the patriarch, the imperially appointed patriarch. Proterius was killed in this riot. And my sources say that his body was stripped, that it was dragged naked through the streets, that it was dismembered and partially eaten. Upon his death, Timothy the cat returns He gains the sea. He's now the patriarch of Alexandria. And among his first acts are two things. Number one, anathematize Chalcedon. Strong move. Number two, excommunicate Leo, the Pope. Timothy the cat is throwing down his lot decidedly on the side of the Monophysites. Emperor Leo, he's not really sure what to do. So he called up the people down at Pew Research, and he said, hey, I think I'd like to send out a survey to all the bishops around the world. You guys do this, don't you? Yeah, I need 1,600. Yeah, send them to the bishops. Two questions. Number one, 
Should Chalcedon be upheld? Number two, should Timothy be retained? Timothy the cat. This process must have taken a long time, I have to imagine. All the bishops spread throughout the world. Now, I don't know that this is every last one of them. But he's sending it to 1,600 bishops. So by the time he gets it out to them, they have a chance to think it over. They make their answers. They send it back. Then they've got the tallying. Okay, yes, yes, no. Must have taken a long time. But the results were pretty pretty positive from our standpoint. A resounding yes to the first and a resounding no to the second. So yes, Chalcedon should be upheld. No, Timothy the cat should not be retained. But Emperor Leo says, hmm, I wonder what I should do. He's obviously not convinced by the virtual unanimous, unanimous consensus of the bishops that he polled. Emperor Leo did not remove Timothy, but he did try to reconcile him with the rest of the church, even leaning on Pope Leo to do the same. Pope Leo sent a letter to Timothy the cat, but the latter refused to compromise. Now, if he wasn't already, this surely makes him a formal heretic. He has refused to submit to the faith of the church as defined by the ecumenical councils. Chalcedon can now be numbered among them. And he's refused correction by his lawful superior. It seems also that this is a schismatic act, refusing to commune with the bishop of Rome. Remember, he excommunicated Leo. He doesn't want to, I don't want your letter. Keep your letter. I don't need your letter. My sources didn't exactly say this was schismatic. It just implies it. So this is just me talking, but it seems like if you refuse communion with the head, you have refused communion with the body. And you can't be in the body if you refuse communion with the body. The situation remained like this for a few years. In 460, Timothy the cat is finally removed and he's exiled. He has to go to the same place that Dioscorus went, Pamphlagonia. Sounds lovely. It's some backwater in Asia Minor, out in the sticks somewhere. Another Timothy is brought in. Now, this one's an Orthodox Catholic. He upholds Chalcedon. He's kind of an old man. He just wants everybody to get along. His name is also Timothy. Timothy White Turban. Uh, I'm not going to attempt the Greek on that one. Timothy White Turban takes Timothy the cat's place as patriarch of Alexandria. And as I mentioned a moment ago, he's a gentle old man. And all he just wants everybody to be happy. Why can't we just all get along? He wants to reconcile the Monophysites, right? In keeping with Emperor Leo's wishes. So he even puts Dioscorus' name back on the diptychs. Dioscorus is commemorated once more in the liturgy in Alexandria. But this did not satisfy them. The Monophysites, I mean. At this point, a series of deaths sort of changes the players, although the field remains the same, if you will. Anatolius, the patriarch of Constantinople, he had died two years prior in 458, succeeded by a man named Genadius. Genadius was very much a Chalcedonian. The Monophysites believed him to even be Nestorian. So not only is he Chalcedonian, but they say, well, he goes way too far on the other side. He's bringing back this Nestorian heresy. And they cited as evidence of this his own writings. He refused to say Theotokos. Well, so did Nestorius. And he never speaks of a hypostatic union. So he's refusing the same term that Nestorius refused. He's not using Cyril's term. And he loves the Council of Chalcedon. Hmm. Another reason for the Monophysites to reject the Council. 
Genadius is not going to be the conciliatory figure they need him to be because they will never accept a man they believe is a heretic. We have to admire their will on that point. Pope Leo died in 461, succeeded by Hillary. Now, if you recall from part six, Hillary was one of the legates at the robber council of Ephesus. Hillary is the man who helped Flavian, who was injured badly, flee the scene inside the church at Chalcedon, get to the sacristy, get to some safety, quickly write a letter to Leo the Great, and then off Hillary went, all alone, from Ephesus to Rome, taking the path less trodden for fear of imperial spies, because Dioscorus had exerted his will at the robber council. This Hillary, who credits his successful escape to St. John the Evangelist, he is now Pope. As Pope, he added a chapel to the Lateran Basilica and dedicated it to St. John. Hillary, however, didn't last very long. He died in 468, and he's replaced by a man named Simplicius. Simplicius was, uh, was I should say, Pope for 15 years, give or take. He'll take us from 468 to 483. Now, Genadius, the man who had succeeded Anatolius, he died in 471, and he's replaced by a certain Acacius, the patriarch, the, the new patriarch of Constantinople. Acacius and Simplicius are going to be side by side as we chart the rest of the course for today's episode. Emperor Leo died in 474. Now, this is interesting. He's succeeded immediately by a man named Zeno, who is sort of referred to as a Romanized Isaurian. The Isaurians were known to be sort of a rough people. This is somewhere in Western Asia Minor. I think it's sort of like West Central and it's a little South uh, Hill Country. And they were not well liked, the Asarian people in general. Therefore, Zeno, as the emperor, is not well liked. He's Romanized, right? He's sort of, he's Roman enough to get by. But they know, look, we're not thrilled with where you're from. We're not thrilled with your upbringing. We don't care for your private life, and we don't care for your public character. Because of these factors and some turmoil within his own household, Zeno is almost immediately ousted. His mother-in-law, Verena, riles up some people who already despise him, and they just shove him out. Goodbye. No more Zeno. Instead, they put a man on the throne whose name is Basilicus. Basilicus, in 475, he wants to be very, very friendly to the Monophysites. He recalled Timothy the cat from exile to bring him back to Alexandria. And he had an encyclical circulated uh, that was meant to be signed by all of the bishops to whom it was sent. And it anathematized Leo's tome and anything done at Chalcedon in violation of Nicaea. And we should pause here for a moment. What was done at Chalcedon that violates Nicaea? Well, Leo said Canon 28, but I'm not sure that's what Basilicus had in mind. We, the faithful of the world, we can give the answer that nothing at Chalcedon violated Nicaea as far as the faith is concerned. But I'm pretty sure Basilicus had the doctrinal development of the two natures in the person of Christ in mind when he made that statement. You see, Nicaea didn't talk about that. Ephesus didn't talk about that. And Basilicus wants to distance Chalcedon by saying, well, anything that's over here that doesn't go with the faith that we've received, mm, we're going to reject that. We're going to anathematize that. 
And anyone who refuses, by the way, will be punished by exile or deposition or both. There's a lesson here. Why such strong opposition to Chalcedon? Why do the Monophysites care this much? Why does Basilicus care this much? Because it seemed to them, I'm trying to give a fair reading here, it seemed to them to conflict with the faith they had received. It seemed to conflict to Nicaea, conflict with Nicaea, with Constantinople, with Ephesus, with Cyril's theology, with the Twelve Anathemas. It seemed to be Nestorian. They want to talk about two natures. Well, how can you have two natures if there's only one person? So you must also mean two persons. But we just did this in 431. That was condemned. You can't say that. So we need to just stick with what Cyril said. One incarnate nature of the divine word. That's the banner under which the Monophysites want to make their camp. That's their rallying cry. So in a word, the Monophysites in the 400s rejected the council because they believed that it broke with the faith they had received. They said, I mean, you could hear them. You could hear them if you pictured in your head. Why was Chalcedon necessary? Don't you know the church has been infiltrated? Don't you know Leo, the Pope, was kind of a heretic? He was a little Nestorian because he wants to have these two natures. We reject this council. By their fruits, you will know them. So they may say. I've heard all that before. I can't recall where. Hmm. Moving on. So Timothy the cat. Basilicus recalls him. He goes to Alexandria. But first, he wants to stop by Constantinople. Thanks a lot, Emperor. Appreciate that, Your Highness. And he's going to assist Basilicus in promulgating this encyclical the one that anathematizes Leo's tome, and anything at Chalcedon that violates Nicaea. Acacius, the patriarch of Constantinople, refused to sign it. Good for him. Timothy proceeds to Alexandria, stopping at Ephesus along the way to appoint a decidedly monophysite bishop. He proclaims, while he's there, that Acacius is deposed. Now, why not do that in the capital? Hmm. Maybe he was intimidated. Maybe Acacius had more power than Timothy had in Constantinople. Makes sense. Whatever the case may be, Timothy the cat declares Acacius deposed. And so in Timothy's mind, sede vacante in Constantinople. At Alexandria... He assumed the patriarchal throne, and he very, very graciously let Timothy White Turban go. He gave him a pension, a very generous pension, one penny a day. Now, Timothy, as I mentioned before, he was an old man. He was very genteel. He really wanted nothing to do with this controversy. He was very happy to go retire quietly as a monk, collecting his money, never to be heard from again. Now, Basilicus's reign was a bit attenuated, we might say. The next year, in 476, he was unseated by Zeno. Zeno's back. Basilicus is sent into exile, where he and his children were starved to death. And the about 700 bishops who had signed Basilicus's encyclical, suddenly recanted. Shocking. And they turned their backs on Timothy the cat. Timothy was deposed, but when the officials went to deliver the sentence, they found him old and sick, so they didn't harm him. They let him go on his merry way. And upon Timothy's death, a short time later, uh, it, this would have been in 482, Timothy's death. A man named Peter the Horse, that's H-O-A-R-S-E, something to do with his vocal cords. Peter the Horse, another Monophysite, was quickly installed in Timothy the Cat's place. Peter was almost immediately driven out of the city, and 
guess who's back? Timothy White Turban, coming out of retirement yet again to be the patriarch of Alexandria. That's a mess. The Eastern Church needs to get their act together. But the West is no better. Let's take a quick peek. So with the East in this ferment over the Monophysite heresy, the West, they've got problems all their own. 476, now I've, I've mentioned this before in a prior episode, but I'm saying it again because we've reached this spot on our timeline. 476 is the classic year that's given for the decline or, or the, the ceasing, if you will, of the Western Roman Empire. They say, we're done, we're done here. Right? It's not exactly like if, if it was a light switch or something like that. It's been a long process, hundreds of year, hundreds of year process. But in 476, it sort of comes to a head because there was this German named Odo Vacar. He deposes Romulus Augustus, who was the emperor in the West. And he declares himself the king of of Italy. It's the first time in a millennia that a non-Roman is ruling in Rome. This is not entirely unprecedented. However, for the last thousand years or so, it hasn't been this way. And this is why historians affix the date of 476 to the destruction of the Western Roman Empire, because it's not a Roman who's in charge anymore. Now, technically, there still was a Roman emperor, in the West. But everybody knew what the deal was. He's not in charge. He's just emperor in name only. To add insult to injury, Odo Vacar, when he deposed Romulus Augustus, he says, hey, kid, uh, give me your clothes too. I got to send them back to Zeno. We don't need that anymore around here. And Zeno appears to have accepted this as just the, the reality of the matter. Well, okay, Here's all the imperial regalia. I guess I'll just put it in storage. The imperial structure is collapsing all the way around in the West. Britain has been lost, and they're increasingly isolated, not only by water, but northern, western, and central Europe are being consistently overrun by barbarian tribes. This has been going on for at least 100 years, and probably a little more. Most of these tribes were pagan. A few of them were Aryan, because the Aryans, uh, back in their heyday, they actually sent missionaries out to preach their, their heretical faith. And there were a few Catholics, but not many. Um, a very small minority. So the situation in the West is as unpleasant as the situation in the East, just on different levels, right? Political versus ecclesiastical. So back to the east we go. Now, the resistance of the Monophysites to Chalcedon. Remember, these are the, mm, the, the rad trads of their day, right? Back in the 400s, these are the guys who were like, yeah, Chalcedon's heresy. I know better. Cyril, he teaches the truth. Ephesus, Dioscorus. These guys, they just can't get along. And Acacius of Constantinople, the patriarch, he's distanced himself from the West. He sees the struggles that are going on over there, and he sort of rethinks his position. Do I really need to be so opposed to these Monophysites? Maybe I can try to reconcile with them, right? This manifests itself, his attempts at reconciliation, manifests itself in one episode in particular. When Timothy White Turban died, uh, well, immediately before he died, he sends a delegate to Constantinople. Timothy White Turban, he may have been old and gentle, but he was no fool. He wanted to ensure that an Orthodox Chalcedonian would take his place. So he sent a man named John Talia as a, a legate, to Constantinople. And John, when he's there, his job is to get the emperor to agree, and Acacius, the patriarch, to allowing 
the successor of Timothy White Turban to, to ensuring that this person is orthodox, okay? Not a monophysite. And Zeno agrees, and Acacius agrees. Except they said, one condition, John, can't be you. You have to recuse yourself. You cannot be a candidate for this position. Timothy died a short time later, in 482, and the people of Alexandria elevated their new patriarch, John Talia. He went back on his word. Acacius refused to acknowledge him as a legitimate patriarch. And because he did this, he was looking for someone whom he could acknowledge. Well, there was this one guy... When Timothy the cat died, they quickly ordained and sort of shoved into his place this Peter the horse. Yeah, he's a monophysite. That's okay. Track him down. Let's see if he'll play ball. To accomplish his mission, Acacius had written up an encyclical of his own uh, called the Formula of Union, or in Greek, Henotikon. He sends it to Peter the horse, who is all too ready to sign this bad boy, right? The Henoticon was written up by Acacius, but it was really meant to be a letter from Zeno himself. It was meant to be an imperial edict defining the limits of orthodoxy. The letter declares that the true faith is that which is in accord with Nicaea, confirmed by Constantinople, and Ephesus, and Cyril's 12 anathemas. No mention of Leo's tome. No mention of the Council of Chalcedon. No mention of two natures in the one person of Christ. So the implication is pretty clear. Acacius is trying to woo the Monophysites using Zeno's authority by simply not mentioning all the stuff they disagree with. When Peter the horse gets a look at this letter, and he realizes that if I accept this, the patriarch of Constantinople will accept me, and I'll be the legitimate patriarch of Antioch. So obviously, Peter the horse, it's in his best interest to sign it. Now again, what could we say about this formula of union? trying to look at things from their perspective in the year 482. Well, suppose we don't mention Chalcedon and Leo's Tome and Two Natures. We didn't say anything against it. Can't we extend the olive branch across the aisle? Can't we work with these monophysite heretics, try to bring them along, right? We just all need to be in union with one another. Many bishops felt this way. Many Catholic and Monophysite-leaning bishops signed uh, Acacius's, or it goes down in history as Zeno's Henoticon, but it was written by Acacius. But nonetheless, a lot of them signed it. They thought, okay, fine, we'll reconcile, this will be great. There was one guy who held out, the Patriarch of Antioch. Calendion was his name. He was a Catholic, very Orthodox. He refused to sign. Now, sort of unfortunate for him, because he was also mixed up in maybe a coup to overthrow Zeno by some of his own countrymen, the Asaurians. Zeno got wind of this, Calendian's involved, and he won't sign my letter. What did I say would happen to people? Oh, that's right, exile. He was deposed and sent into Egypt. So he went from Antioch, which was where Nestorius was from, to the Monophysite stronghold in Egypt. And in Calendion's place, Zeno props up a bishop who is willing to sign. Another Peter with another funny name, Peter the Laundryman, or Peter the Fuller in some sources. The Pope at this time, I mentioned several minutes ago, Simplicius. He reigns until 483. We're in 482. 
Not much longer. I don't think he knew that, though. Simplicius was infuriated by Acacius's attempt at reconciling these heretics. They refused to accept a legitimate council ratified by Rome. Again, they're clinging to what they believe is the authentic faith. They're the rad trads of the 400s. They reject the council as heretical. They say, we know better. Simplicius is not happy. But he died. And he's succeeded by a man named Felix. Felix sent a delegation to Constantinople to get the matter cleared up. In other words, to get Acacius to fall back in line with orthodoxy, quit playing footsies with the Monophysites, and get yourself back in line with the true faith, Chalcedon included. But his legates were wooed or bribed or otherwise persuaded, and they did not carry out Felix's will. So Felix, in return, holds a synod at Rome in 484. Felix excommunicates Acacius and anyone who remains in communion with him. So now the bishops of the world have a choice, Felix or Acacius. Felix, Acacius. The choice to us obviously seems pretty clear, but back then it wasn't so easy. Felix, after the Synod of uh, 484 in Rome, he sends another delegation to Constantinople to do his bidding. And they too were somehow persuaded not to. I have a feeling there was some money involved, maybe some women, maybe a little bit of both. Not sure. Nonetheless, Felix is thwarted twice. So, plan C. He got some of his faithful monks in the city of Constantinople to pin the notice of excommunication to the back of Acacius's vestments during the divine liturgy. Hmm. Sort of an unsavory thing to do. Although if I were Felix, I would probably feel like I've run out of options. Nonetheless... Acacius responds by removing Felix from the diptychs. He's taken the Pope's name out of the liturgy. And the result? Open schism in the church for 35 years. I feel like I've been talking for 35 years, especially since this is take two. Almost out of coffee. It's been good, though. I think we covered everything we needed to cover. We started with... Right after Chalcedon, we looked at Leo's reaction. He confirmed the definition, but not the canons. And then the Monophysites, they start to push back. Remember, they think Chalcedon's Nestorian. They think it's heretical. They're not going to stand for that. They've got saints on their side. They've got councils on their side. So they say. They didn't have the magisterium on their side. Nonetheless... We're now in a state of open schism. This is what we refer to nowadays as the Acacian schism, named after the patriarch Acacius, because he just could not bring himself to submit to Felix. Well, part nine, we're going to have a lot to talk about. We'll get up through the Acacian schism. We'll look at what happened after that as we lead up to Constantinople three, And... As we close out, sipping my now cold coffee, still frustrated, mm. we will never give up. We will keep on smiling, and we will memento mori. Good night.